Hello and welcome to another Data Science Cornwall video. Today we're going to be looking at the really challenging problem of working with very high dimensional data and in particular how to visualize it in a way that really reveals any structure within that data, any patterns or clusters. And we'll be looking at something called TSNE, which is a fairly good solution for this. And the focus of this video is on developing an intuitive understanding of how it works so that we can use it effectively and not misuse it. And also to look at some code for working with TSNE and, and to show actually it's very simple, it's not complicated at all. So just a quick summary of what we'll be doing today. We'll be looking at the problem, why it's a problem, talking a little bit about this TSNE solution and getting an intuitive understanding for it, looking at some code and some examples which I've chosen, um, which gradually help us understand how it can work and why it works, and to finish off with a couple of gotchas just to make sure that we don't fall into sort of common traps. So at the top left here, you can see a way of visualizing one dimensional data. We can plot it along a line. We can create histograms and they give an indication of, you know, where there is lots of data, how it's distributed. And that's a very kind of easy thing to do. At the top right here, we've got um, a two dimensional plot, a scatter graph showing two dimensional data and we can see some clusters there. And again, that's a very simple way of visualizing two dimensional data. There's a correspondence there between the two dimensional chart and two dimensional data. We can show all the dimensions of that data. Now moving on to three dimensional data it becomes a little bit trickier. We can kind of do it by giving the illusion of drawing a three dimensional space by doing 3D charts, for example. But when we do that, we do miss out um, a little bit of the detail and we potentially misrepresent what the data is. So looking at this, we don't know how far back or forward these data points are, and we'd need other sort of graphical clues to show us where that data really is. And depending on the angle that we're using, it might show patterns that aren't really there, or it might hide some as well. So the higher the dimension of the data, the more difficult it is to really meaningfully show it. And when we say meaningfully, we mean to show patterns that really are there and not to give the illusion of patterns that really aren't there. So let's think about data that might be much higher in dimension. So 43 dimensional data or, you know, 16 dimensional data, even seven dimensional data. That's data where each point has seven features or 43 features, um, 43 axes. If we were thinking in terms of these kinds of charts, that's the challenge. And often we do work with data with such high uh, numbers of features for each record and trying to visualize that is a, is a challenge. Um, and quite an interesting good solution emerged recently, developed in part by um, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who is known, is known for a lot of his work with the kind of resurgence of neural networks in the last uh, couple of decades. And that solution goes by the name of TSNE. Um, and what we're looking at here is I've written n dimensional data, but we can think of it as three dimensional data. Could be four, could be five, could be much higher. And what it tries to do is to reduce the number of dimensions to, it doesn't have to be two dimensions, that's the most useful for visualizing. And what it tries to do is preserve two things. If data points are close by in the high dimensional space, it tries to retain that closeness in the small dimensional space. If points are very far apart, it also tries to keep them apart in this smaller dimensional space. That's all it tries to do. So where these points appear on this smaller dimensional chart, we shouldn't read too much into that. These could be here, could be here, could be here. That's not the important thing that this process preserves. It only preserves closeness and farness, as it were. And it does that by applying forces um, between points. So if they're close, they're attractive. And if they're far, 
there's a repulsive force, and it starts by throwing random points onto this small dimensional space, and then applying those forces repeatedly, iteratively, and shuffling those points. So if there's a repulsion, it'll move them further apart, and if there's a an attraction, it'll move them closer. And after a number of iterations, the arrangement will settle down, and we can see, you know, a chart, which hopefully is uh, interesting in revealing that structure of what's close and what's not. So that's important to underline that, what this TSNA process is good for and what it isn't. Um, it's good for showing clusters of data, those things that are similar and close, but we shouldn't read too much into any other kind of arrangement for where these points end up. Now let's look at some um, code examples. So the first one we're going to look at is very simple two-dimensional data, and we're going to map that down to, again, two dimensions, so it's from two to two, just to see the effect. Um, so it's not really dimension reduction, but we want to see the effect the TSNA process has. We'll then look at some three-dimensional data, which is a step up in terms of complexity, but still something we can think about. Then we'll look at some quite high-dimensional data, I think 64-dimensional data, and then we'll set um, uh, this TSNA process a challenge with some deliberately constructed, quite challenging um, data, and that's you'll see what that is in a minute. So let's look at some code. So these um, um, Python notebooks are online and you'll be able to get the links to them. Um, and they're really to illustrate how simple it is to use the TSNE um, libraries within the very popular sklearn um, library for Python. So here we've imported uh, NumPy, sklearn and matplotlib, matplotlib, the common tools for um, working with arrays and for plotting charts. So we can run that. This is running in Google Colab, which is an online service, so you don't need to install anything yourself. Here we're going to be um, creating some random data. It's not quite so random. These are normal distributions to create three clusters. And we can see the shape of that data is 120 points and each of them is two dimensional. So it's 120 by two. Then we're going to visualize this data and it's always a good idea to do that so you can see what data you're working with. And here we can see there are three clusters fairly spread, they're not very tight. And we're going to see what happens when we apply the TSNE process to it. And we do that by creating a TSNE object from the um, library, um, the imported module there. And we're going to tell it that we want to reduce down to two dimensions, to two components. And there's another parameter here which we can talk about later. 30 is a good one to start with, but you can experiment yourselves. So let's run that. That creates an object, but it hasn't done the application yet. It hasn't applied the process to the data. And to do that, we simply run a function called fit transform on the data, and we end up with some new data, which is the reduced um, reduced data. And that can take a few seconds. And here's a result. And what we can see here is those three clusters, which are fairly spread, now very clearly distinguished and separated, one, two, three clusters. They're very close together, uh, and it's very apparent that that data did contain three clusters. Um, so you can see with this simple example that the it's exaggerated those clusters, and that can be useful. Um, here's an important point. If we run that process again on the data, we end up with a different arrangement. So that underlines the point we made earlier about not reading too much into where on this graph those clusters lie. There are just three clusters here. And run it again, and it'll end up somewhere else. And that's because we start off with randomly arranged points, and then apply that iterative process of attraction and repulsion. So we can end up with different final arrangements. So that's the first simple example. Now let's look at uh, another example 
where we work with three-dimensional data. So we're loading in the same modules. Here is a looks like a lot of code, but you don't need to really read it. it all it does is it creates quite a few clusters in that three-dimensional space. And we can see that it's three-dimensional and there's 280 points in there. And let's um let's take slices of those three-dimensional points of those three of that three-dimensional space. So here we're plotting maybe the first and second dimensions, second and third, and first and third. In fact, yep, one zero one zero two one two um, are the axes we've taken. So we've got three-dimensional data where we're taking two-dimensional uh, slices of it, and it's not really clear that there are distinct um, clusters. We might be able to say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe. Um, they're clearer on this one and not so clear on this one. One, two, three, four, five on that one. One, two, three, four, five, six on that one. Um, so that's not such a bad thing to do. Let's look at um, this 3D plot. And again, it's a bunch of points spread out in this 3D space. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It looks like there's seven clusters. One, two, three, four, five, maybe. Um, if they had uh, different data, it might not be so clear. You can see from these slices, we counted less clusters. And if we had a different angle into this 3D space, then perhaps we would have obscured clusters and not see them properly. So let's apply this um, TSNA process in the same way as before. And there you go, like magic, there are very well-defined clusters there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's much clearer than these plots. So you can see this process is very good at extracting out um, clusters of data from high dimensions and really making them distinct and clear in a smaller dimensional space. Let's progress on to the next code, which is going to be using very high dimensional data. And we're going to be using a data set which comes with sklearn, um, the Python package, which um, is inspired by this website here, which you can link to, and I'll include a link on the YouTube video. Um, and it's using eight by eight images of digits, so pixels uh, forming images. And let's have a look at one. There's one there. And what we're going to do is, because it's 8 by 8 there are 64 values for each digit. So you can think of each digit, each record, each image as having 64 values. It's 64 dimensional data. And let's have a quick look at one. There. So this is, um, this is showing dimension 2 across all the 500 data points. We've selected 500 out of the 1500. So this is showing dimension two, that one there, which would be zero, one, two, that pixel. So it's showing the value of zero, one, two, the third pixel for all of those 500 data points. So it's taken a slice along the, the dimension two, starting zero, so it's the third dimension. Um, so you can see the values there. And looking at the numbers, there's not much to see. Let's plot dimensions two and three. Um, and that's, that's it's not a lot to give us any insight there. Let's maybe try a different, um, a different um, dimension, two and three, for example, two and 13. Again, not much to see there, maybe 32. Okay, that's not very insightful. So if we were looking at just the, the raw data um, and we didn't know what kind of data it was, if we didn't know it was uh, images of, of digits, looking at the data like this wouldn't really give us a lot of insight. And this really is where TSNE really comes in. Let's not give up on those um, simple charts yet. Let's try a three-dimensional plot showing a dimension two, three, and four. And again, it is a three-dimensional space, but there's not a lot of insight there. Let's try a different dimension. Mm, again, 
nothing really sticking out. So we can't really see any clusters or groupings there like this. So let's apply TSNE. So just using a perplexity of 20 there. Reducing those 64 dimensions down to two and that took a few more seconds and you'd expect that. Now let's plot the reduced data. There you go. Now we can definitely see clear clusters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10, maybe 11. There's certainly something definitely going on with that data. There are definitely clusters of data points. There's something about these data points in this cluster that makes them similar and the same here and the same here. Um, if we run that again, we might get a different uh, arrangement. That's there. Again, there are definitely data points that are closer and to each other and definite clusters. And again there. Now, if we didn't know what the data was, this would give us a big clue that there was data groups that were similar to each other. Um, what I'm going to do now is show a version of that chart color coded with the actual digits. Um, this is using inside information in a way to, to kind of judge how effective that clustering was. And here, so the red was zero. And these are all the points that relate to the zero image, image digit zero. Um, these are sixes, these are fours. So it really does work. It's a way of confirming that this process has put together those data points for the same digits. There are some things that go wrong, like there's a green there and these two are quite close together and maybe that cluster um, is merging into that one. Maybe an eight looks like a one perhaps, um, but you can see there's a lot of power in this technique. Um, let's finally look at a bit of a challenging data set where we deliberately try to fool this method. So I'm going to create a specific data set with two clusters and a ring around them. And you'll see what I mean when I plot it. So I've got two clusters there and I've got a ring of data going around it. And it's interesting to think how TSNE will cope with this. And what will it try to do? We can understand and we can guess that this bunch here will be placed close together. It's a nice cluster, same there. But what will it do with these? Will it create lots of small clusters? Will it say that this is one big cluster? Hmm. Remember what the method is trying to do. It's trying to place similar close by data close together in the reduced space. Let's see what happens. So we're applying and there you go. So it has actually separated out the three shapes. Let's do it again for another run in case it produces something a bit different. Same again, it's produced three distinct shapes because there are three distinct shapes in the data. And the fact that this is no longer wrapping the others shouldn't surprise us. And we said at the start that we shouldn't read anything into the arrangement of shapes and data on the final plot. But that's quite powerful. It succeeded in keeping those data points belonging to the ring close together and separate from the other two clusters. Um, fantastic. So that's the code we were going to look at. Um, we were finally going to talk a little bit about some gotchas. And the two main gotchas are that because we're starting from a random starting point, the method works by starting with randomly arranged points and then moves them according to those attractive and repulsive forces. We end up with um, a different result each time. So we shouldn't read anything into um, those arrangements. And also remember that it's, this process isn't trying to arrange things meaningfully. So they can be arranged in different ways and we shouldn't read anything into that. All it's trying to do is preserve closeness and distance and that's it. Now the perplexity parameter is a way of telling the method how many neighbors each one should have. So it's a way of trying to define what the target closeness of clusters should be. Um, and you have to play with that a little bit as you explore data. Um, 
because some data is much more spread and some, some isn't and doesn't need a high perplexity value. And sometimes you can reveal clusters with different perplexity values. But there is a gotcha there, which is that even with random noise, deliberately random noise that should have no pattern in it, if you use TSNE on it, you think you're seeing patterns and clusters. So do keep that in mind and I'll link to this website which has both an interactive demo plus also some very really good um, test cases for um, the TSNA process showing that it can actually result in slightly misleading results sometimes. So do keep that in mind. Anyway, um, we'll stop there. Um, I hope this short um, video has been useful in allowing you to look at very high dimensional data, giving you an intuition of how it works and also keeping in mind a few of those gotchas uh, just to make sure that you use the method sort of safely. Um, fantastic. So we'll see you um, in another future video. Bye.